we had actually stopped having children. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, and we had taken steps and then had them reversed. I know that's personal, but I just wanted to share with you that it was one of the worst mistakes I ever made in my life because we look at those children and think that we wouldn't have them. And so I, I take a chance going on a limb just sharing that, just inviting you not to ever take any permanent measures that could prevent you from receiving the gifts that God would want you to have that you could spend the, literally the rest of your life regretting or wondering what you could have missed out on. So we're just thankful that God allowed um, forgave me and allowed my, was merciful and allowed my decision to be reversed and has blessed us with those other children and hopefully will bless us with some more. So Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Because most of us are pretty familiar with this verse and probably familiar with the expectation that wives will respect their husbands, we lose some of the impact of what this verse is saying. So I want you to, I want to try to establish what we would expect this verse to say if we were not so familiar with it. Since Paul just finished commanding husbands to love their wives and then described in detail what it looks like for husbands to love their wives, this is how we would expect verse 33 to read. Let each one of you in particular love his own wife as himself and let the wife love her husband as herself is what we would expect it to say, but you notice there's nothing about wives loving their husbands. So even though husbands are commanded to love their wives, wives are given the command to respect their husbands. Before we go any further, let me just make a brief point. This is not to say that husbands don't want to be loved. When, if you look in Titus 2 at some of the responsibilities for older women to teach younger women, it says that older women should teach younger women to love their husbands. So you do have scriptural support for wives to love their husbands, and it's definitely not to say that wives don't want to be respected. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it's almost synonymous to say that a, a husband is to honor or to give respect to his wife, and so wives definitely want to be respected too. But between the two of those, it's more important for husbands to be respected, and it's more important for wives to be loved. And this brings us to lesson one. Husbands must feel like their wives respect them. Husbands must feel like their wives respect them. And if you briefly look earlier in the chapter at verse 22, wives were commanded to submit to their husbands. Now you're told wives, or now wives are commanded to respect their husbands. And so you could ask, well, is there a difference between a wife submitting to her husband and respecting her husband? And there is. If there wasn't, we wouldn't be doing these two different messages. We would just have one message on submission because if submission and respect were the same, why distinguish between them? But there is a difference. A wife is commanded to submit to her husband, hopefully I made this clear, for when she disagrees with him. So submission deals with the way a wife responds when she disagrees with her husband. Respect deals with the way a wife feels toward her husband in general and treats him as a result of those feelings. And I want you to notice how I worded this lesson. It doesn't say wives must respect their husbands, right? It doesn't say wives must respect their husbands. It says husbands must be, or it doesn't even say husbands must be respected. It says husbands must feel respected. And the reason it says that is because if I was to say to a wife, you need to respect your husband, what could she say? We kind of talked about this yesterday. I do. I do respect my husband. But now, just like it's not about what a husband claims, earlier we talked about that, it's about how a wife feels, well, now it's not about what a wife claims that she respects her husband. It's about how a husband feels because there have definitely been times where I have heard a wife say, I do respect my husband, but the husband has said, I don't feel respected. I don't feel like my wife respects me. The truth is it's much easier for a wife to say, I love you, than it is for her to show that through respect. It wouldn't be too much to say that a wife actually expresses her love for her husband by respecting him. <clears throat> and I say that because if a woman did legitimately love her husband, but he does not feel respected, will he feel loved? No, he won't. So even if a wife does love her husband, if he doesn't feel respected, he will not feel loved by her. Consider this. Most wives, they like cards, phone calls, emails, flowers, any number of things communicating their husband's love for them. But while most husbands might appreciate some of these things, perhaps cards or phone calls or emails, saying how much their wives love them, what they desire more is their wife's respect. I don't need my wife to do many of those things for me, but I do crave her letting me know that she respects me or can look up to me, and it causes me to want to be a respectable man. 
when, when Katie lets me know that she respects me, it makes me want to not lose her respect or do anything that would make it hard for her to respect me. If you think of wives' frustration toward their husbands, when you've heard wives, maybe they've gossiped or maybe they've just been sharing their hurt with their, about their husband with you, it usually sounds something like this. I don't feel like my husband loves me. I wish my husband loved me more. He never tells me he loved me. But if you think about a husband's frustration toward his wife, it usually sounds something like, I wish my wife respected me more. I wish my wife followed my lead. I wish my wife supported my decisions. Just as important as it is for wives to feel loved, it's equally important for husbands to feel respected. A good perspective for both husbands and wives to keep in mind, as if I address the wives as first, as important it is, as it is for you to feel loved by your husband, it is that important for your husband to feel respected by you. If I can address a gentleman and say, as important as it is for you to feel respected, it is as important for your wife to feel loved by you. Research supports all this. I don't mention research because I think it gives credibility to God's word. We don't need research for God's word to have credibility. The reason that I'll sometimes mention to my congregation that research, research supports what God's word says is because I think it's pretty um, almost comical that sometimes thousands or millions of dollars will be invested to learn something that God's word has been teaching for some number of millennia, right? Well, research supports this, and probably the foremost researcher on this subject is a man named Dr. Emerson Egerich, who wrote the, the well-known book, Love and Respect. And I like Dr. Egerich. I asked him if he would endorse, endorse marriage God's way. He wrote back and said, I'm so busy, I don't even have time to read and endorse my own pastor's books. I was just happy that he sent a response to me. I appreciate him. I appreciate all of his work. And I'm going to share a few things. He asked 400 men, if you were forced to choose would you prefer to feel alone and unloved or disrespected and inadequate? 74% of men said that they would rather feel alone and unloved than disrespected and inadequate. In other words, 74% of men said respect was more important to them than love. He conducted the same test on women. He found a similar percentage of women who said that they would rather feel disrespected and inadequate than alone and unloved. Or in other words, for women, about 74% or three-fourths of them said they'd rather feel loved than respected. Based on this data, Dr. Egerich wrote, a wife needs love just as she needs air to breathe, and a husband needs respect just as he needs air to breathe. In another survey, they asked 7,000 people, when you're in conflict with your spouse, do you feel unloved or disrespected? 83% of the men said what? They feel disrespected. 72% of the women said that they feel unloved. And so the point is, often conflicts take, a conflict takes place in marriage when men feel disrespected and when women feel unloved. It's really important to understand that because that can help prevent a lot of conflict if husbands are committed to making their wives feel loved and wives are committed to making their husbands feel respected. Now, I want to remind you of something I mentioned, I think, in the last message. Just like if God's word commands husbands to understand their wives, we can expect the world to act like wives can't be understood. If God's word is going to command wives to respect their husbands, then what are we going to expect from the world? That the world is going to act like men what? Shouldn't be respected. Or the world is going to present men as though they are not respectable, they're bumbling, they're, they're foolish, they're incompetent, they're inept. And I would say that the world has done this unbelievably well. The world has succeeded in this, whether it is commercials, television shows, books, general counsel from women who receive some platform within the community or the culture. Husbands or, or men in general are regularly made to look incompetent. They're regularly made to look foolish. They are made to look bumbling. They're made to look incompetent. And as a result, well, women, women can't trust husbands. You can't depend on them to do anything. And so ladies, when you disrespect your husband or you treat him that way, you're giving into the world's agenda. You're disregarding what God's word teaches and you're following that agenda that conflicts with scripture. Now the obvious question then is, what does it look like for wives to respect their husbands? I'd like to answer that by also answering what it looks like for wives to disrespect their husbands. Respecting your husband, it means you admire him. You look up to him, you hold him in high regard. You support him. You strive to be his biggest encourager. 
A wife respects her husband by considering how hard he works to take care of his family, the sacrifices that he makes to be a good father and husband. Now, while I know that there are some deadbeat husbands or fathers in this world, it doesn't seem to me that that is one of the big problems in the church. I see most men working hard to take care of their families. I see, I see most men making large sacrifices of their time and energy to be good providers. And I just want to say, ladies, if your husband is in that category, you need to appreciate it. He might not be the spiritual giant you want him to be, or there might be some other ways that, that you see him needing to grow. But if your husband is working hard and taking care of his family, that is very commendable. That's something that you should applaud and support and let him know how much you appreciate it. Conversely, a wife disrespects her husband when she's regularly discontent. Discontent with her life, discontent with her home, discontent with her family. A wife who's regularly unsatisfied or discontent makes her husband feel like what? Any guesses? A failure. A wife who's regularly discontent with her lot in life makes her husband feel like a failure because he is the one who's providing and apparently not providing well enough for her. Few attitudes communicate respect more than thankfulness. Conversely, few attitudes communicate disrespect more than discontentment and, and uh, thanklessness. If you just think about your kids, I mean, how much does it bother, when you, bother you? How disrespected do you feel as a parent when you do something for your children and they don't appreciate it? Conversely, how respected do you feel when you do something for your children and they thank you? We pull away from places and Katie often leads our children to thank me, even for small things. If I take them out for pizza or I take them someplace, Katie regularly leads the children and it seems they've got, almost got it down now where sometimes they'll beat her to it and they say, thank you, daddy, for whatever it is because Katie knows that that's how um, I feel respected when my children appreciate things, but I suspect that's the case with all of you. If you can apply it to your children, then ladies, you should apply that to your relationship with your husband and understand he'll feel respected if you appreciate him, the sacrifices he makes, and he'll feel disrespected if you seem, th seem thankless and discontent. A wife also disrespects her husband when she talks down to him, when she treats him like a child, when she makes him feel like he's a little boy who's in trouble, when she interrupts him or when she talks over him. There have been a few situations where I've been in conversation with perhaps a group of people and there's some husband who's talking and he can barely get an e a word in because his wife keeps interrupting and she keeps talking over him. And I, I think perhaps she must not understand how disrespectful that is um, to constantly act as though she doesn't care what he has to say. A wife disrespects her husband when she rolls her eyes at him, when she huffs and puffs, if she ever wags her finger at him or ju just treats him like he's a little boy. Wives disrespect their husbands when they hide things from them. Two become one, and hiding things from your husband means that you don't respect him enough to share things with him or share with him what he should know or be aware of as the head of that household. That's You're breaking the union the God is intended. I don't want to pry into your homes too much, but I will say I don't, see, I don't see any justification for a married couple to have two separate checking accounts. I cannot find one good reason it would ever be beneficial for a husband and wife to have two separate checking accounts. If two people become one flesh, you should be making every effort to be that one flesh together. And to be able to want to make purchases separate from each other, I, I tend to think what's behind that. Is it a desire to hide things or make purchases that the other person is not aware of. Wives respect their husbands by being wives that their husbands can trust. Let me share a few verses with you <clears throat> from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, 11, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, and he trusts her because he knows she respects him. He knows she won't hide anything from him. Proverbs 31, 12, the virtuous wife does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She protects his name. She protects his reputation. She doesn't slander him or talk bad about him behind his back. It means that she's going to act in a way when he's not around that she would be acting if he was around. And so it's a good thing to consider, ladies, how would my, what, if, what would I say or how would I act if my husband was standing here? On Sunday mornings, or actually for many church events, Katie's like a single mother. And that's fine. During the week is my time to invest in my family and be with them for Sundays and other church events then that's my time that I'm invested in our church family. Now, as a result of that, 
I'm often up front. I can see my wife in the foyer. I know she's around other places in the church. As the senior pastor's wife, she's regularly involved in, in conversations with people. And I cannot tell you what a tremendous blessing it is to me to never have to wonder what my wife is saying. I never have to worry that she's embarrassing me. I never have to worry that she's saying anything shameful about me. Or, and it's not to say that there are not shameful things she could say about me. This is not a joke. If Katie wanted to slander me, if she wanted to share my weaknesses, and there are many, if she wanted to criticize me, she could, and she could be honest. There are plenty of ways that Katie can make me look bad, and I never worry about it. I trust that she's always going to share any of those observations or criticisms with me in public, or in private, not in public. I can tell her heart is for others to be able to respect me. And so I just encourage you, ladies, don't prevent your husband from ever having to wonder what you would say if he's not around, or how you might act if he's not around. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 31, 23, also in the virtuous wife passage. Her husband is respected in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Does it seem odd that there is a verse in the virtuous wife passage, a verse that is entirely about a wife praising the husband? Why is there a verse in this passage praising the husband about him sitting in the gates among the elders of the land? And the answer is there's no way that he would be respected and sitting among the elders if he had a wife who was talking bad about him behind his back. There's no way that this man would have this position if his wife was embarrassing him or embarrassing herself through shameful behavior or conduct. A wife who slanders her husband or disrespects him or embarrasses herself and by extension him and the family will never have a, hand, a leader in the community or in the church because she'll always be married to a man that nobody respects because of the way that she has acted. It's a very unfortunate thing that there have been a few people we have not been able to have in leadership positions, not because of the man. Does that make sense? But because of the wife. When we evaluated them, we said, man, he would make a neat elder. One guy, we said, man, he would make a neat associate pastor. Man, he would make a neat leader in this capacity, but his wife disqualifies him. And that's a, that's a terribly unfortunate thing to think that the, the ceiling on a man's service to the Lord is his wife. It's a credit to the virtuous wife that her husband can be respected and sit among the elders because he would not be there without her. He would not be there without her support and encouragement. A wife also disrespects her husband by telling funny stories about his inability to do things or fix things or how many times it took him. So when a wife thinks she's being funny and she's sort of making her fun of her husband in a, in a uh, loose or what she would call probably a light way, it's terribly disrespectful. You look on and you feel pity for that man whose wife would act that way. Now I'll share something from our marriage. Yeah, it's interesting speaking at a marriage conference. I almost want to tell you that I'm not the husband I could look like up here. Uh, if a guy comes and puts on a marriage conference, you could think that, well, he must be this great husband without some number of flaws. No, plenty of flaws plenty of weaknesses, and one of, the, one, one of my weaknesses is I'm not mechanical and I'm not handy. When it comes to fixing things, I mean, I, it's just a terrible struggle for me. And I didn't grow up that way, learning those sorts of things. I was doing, not to make excuses, I just, I, you know, working on a car and fixing houses, all that stuff, just beyond my ability. And so we had this, we were in California, we had this gate or this fence that was falling down. And it went for some period of time until I went out to try to fix it. Now, here's my suspicion, and this is the truth. Most of you gentlemen could go out and fix that gate like that, and it would be no big deal for you to go out and do what I did on that fence. For me, it was like one of the greatest accomplishments of my life. <laughs> okay, so you guys, no big deal. You could do five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things like that on one day. For me, I mean, I still remember this and how proud I felt when I fixed that gate, <laughs> you know, and it was standing after. And so here's why I'm telling you this. When I went in to tell Katie, hey, I fixed this gate, here's what she could have said. Wow, it's about time. Or, oh, that's great. Or how many other guys do you think would have fixed it by now? Or, oh, you know, that's no big deal. Or, oh, it only took you a few months. When are you going to get around to, to all these other things around here that you should fix? Instead, this is what she said. She said, oh, that's wonderful. Let me go out and look at it with you. And so she left whatever she was doing. She walked out of the house, went around to the side, looked at the gate with me, and I remember her kind of standing there, feeling, expressing her pleasure associated with me being able to do this. And she's told me since then that she had no idea that that was going to be meaningful to me. She didn't do that because she obviously she ever thought I'd be talking about it in marriage conferences. 
But the, the point is, that was something that to me was meaningful because I felt respected. It was a big deal to me to be able to do that because I felt fairly outside of my ability to do. And, I, and Katie probably knew that. And so she came out and, and, tre- and she, it, it was a big deal to me. And I guess I would just say Katie acted like it was a big deal to her too. And I appreciated it. that. It made me feel respected. A wife terribly disrespects her husband when she talks bad about him to the children. It's especially important for wives to know that they destroy their husband's credibility with the children when they disagree. When a wife disagrees with her husband, corrects him and talks down to him or belittles him in front of the children. Now, ladies, let me be clear. This is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can't disagree with your husband. I'm not saying you can't correct him. I'm not saying you can't share criticisms with him. One of the greatest ways Katie has helped me is in letting me know when I have exasperated our children or talk too long to them. And, you know, that's what Ephesians 6 warns about husbands doing, and it's one of my weaknesses. I, and so those criticisms from Katie are wonderful blessings to me. But the point is, ladies, is there a place and time for you to criticize your husband or share these concerns with him? Yes, privately, not in front of all of the children where his credibility is going to be destroyed. If you, dis- if you disagree with one of your husband's decisions, and you disagree with him in front of the children, you're gonna be chopping him off at the knees. The children are going to recognize that you don't respect their father, and they're gonna have a harder time respecting their father knowing that, that their mother doesn't respect him. So what wives should strive to do is they should strive to let others, especially the children, hear about their husband's better qualities. Now here's the truth, ladies. As you do this, as you look for your husband's best qualities, as you look for your husband's strengths, as you speak well of your husband to others, as you praise your husband to your children or to others, guess what's going to happen with your respect for your husband? It's going to grow. If you're struggling respecting your husband, look for those strengths of his. Look for those positive things you can discuss. And when you do, you'll find your respect for him growing. And the other wonderful thing this does is I'll just tell you, Katie thinks too much of me. She does. She really does. She thinks, she thinks better of me than she should. I am not the man that she thinks I am. But the fact is, I want to be that man because of the way she talks about me. I would like someday to live up to being the man that she thinks I am. And ladies, your husband is not going to have any trouble striving to live up to what you say about him or live down to it. If you will speak well of your husband, he will be convicted to live up to that. But if you slander him, you belittle him, you gossip about him, you treat him like he's a child, your husband is not going to have any trouble living down to that position of disrespect that he recognizes from you. Before I make the next point, oh, excuse me, I already said that about disagreeing in private. When you disagree with your husband, it's interesting that sometimes it can be very helpful sometimes it can be very beneficial. I hope I've been clear enough up to this point. I almost saved this, this teaching for last because I want to have the credibility to share this with you. I hope I've been clear that it's important for a husband to listen to his wife, hear her counsel, hear her advice before he makes any decision. But there's a balance to this that needs to be struck. Sometimes, even when wives respect their husbands, they can send the opposite message when they question every decision he makes, when they second guess everything he says. Even if you respect your husband, ladies, but you're always second guessing him, you're always offering all the reasons he's wrong, you're constantly correcting him, you're chopping him off at the knees when he makes a decision, he's going to feel disrespected. And so the point is, sometimes when wives think they're being helpful, sometimes they really are being helpful, but there's other times that when a wife offers a more fitting solution that it makes the husband feel disrespected. Sometimes a wife's actions, when she's offering all the reasons he's wrong or saying, I don't think that this is gonna work, it's just screaming, you know, I don't trust you. I don't think you know what you're doing. I could do this better than you. Why would you think that that's gonna work? And it usually sounds that way. It usually sounds like, why are you doing it that way? What were you thinking? Didn't I tell you that you should do this instead? Did you really think that that was going to work? Those are the sorts of statements. Statements is almost a little too soft. Those are the sorts of criticisms that make a husband feel disrespected. Ladies, you're, you're going to have to learn your husbands because there are some things that one husband might find to be very disrespectful where another husband might even find it to be beneficial. And I'll give you two examples. 
that have actually taken place today, and I think maybe even one or two people back there noticed it. When I'm preaching, Katie will often do this. It's her way of telling me to slow down. And a few people have seen her do that and gone to talk to her, and she has explained that I find it very beneficial. Katie has heard me not just teach these marriage messages, but lots of other sermons, hundreds of them, or maybe bordering on thousands of times that I've taught the Bible at this point, and she sat in on most of those, or thinking of the number of times we talked Bible studies as a family. Katie, basically the point is Katie can almost finish sentences for me. And so there's times she knows I'm going a certain direction, and it's not a good one. And so she does this to me. And that's my cue to not say what I'm going to say. Well, people have seen her do that, and they've went to talk to Katie, and people have seen her do that, and they've come to talk to me. And, people, and women have said to Katie, hey, I saw when your husband was talking, you were going, and like this, doesn't that bother him? And Katie said, no, he's asked me to do it. Katie actually used to sit in the aisle at church, so she would lean into the aisle and go like this, but it was still, still too conspicuous, and now she sits in the very front. And people come to me, and they said, hey, um, you know, I just, I saw your wife when you were preaching, and the, what, what, is that bothering you? And I'm like, no, I, I think it's really, really helpful. And so the point is, those are things that I find to be beneficial, I, whereas other husbands clearly would find that to be very disrespectful. And so the, what's the point I'm trying to make, ladies? You're going to have to learn your husband. You're going to have to learn what he finds to be respectful. There's been a couple times we left the situation, and we got in the car, and I was, I was bothered by something Katie did that I found to be disrespectful. I could tell by her response she had no idea. She said, I'm really surprised. I would not have said that or done that if I thought that you were going to find that to be disrespectful. And so ladies, strive to understand your husband, what he finds to be respectful and disrespectful. Now, lesson two on your handouts. Wives can love their husbands without respecting them. Wives can love their husbands without respecting them. There are plenty of men walking around and they they would say that their wives love them, but they feel disrespected by them. I actually can't think of a husband that I've met who said his wife didn't love him. I'm sure there would probably be some husbands who would say that. I haven't heard a husband say that, but I have heard plenty of husbands say that they felt like their wives didn't respect them. There is a perfect picture in Scripture of a woman who loved her husband and didn't respect him. This picture in Scripture is so perfect that this woman is the only woman in all of Scripture said to love her husband. You heard that? Correct me. Unless I'm missing something, and if I am, please let me know. There is only one woman in all of Scripture said to love her husband. She also happened to be the woman in Scripture, at least in my mind, who put on the most disrespectful display toward her husband. Any guesses? <laughs> That's a good guess. It's Michael. It's Michael, Saul's daughter. First Samuel 18, 20, it says, Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And so there you have it, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the one woman said to love her husband. It's not to say Sarah didn't love Abraham. It's not to say that Hannah didn't love Peninnah or Elkanah. It's not to say that Rachel didn't love Jacob. I'm sure these wives did love their husbands, but that's not mentioned because what does Scripture emphasize? A wife's respect for her husband. In the New Testament, who is that woman pulled from the Old Testament and set down as an example for wives? We already talked about her briefly. Who is it? Who's the woman pulled from the Old Testament set down as the example? Sarah is, right, in 1 Peter 3. There are no verses in Scripture discussing her feelings or affection for Abraham, say nothing about her love for him. But there are lots of verses showing her what for him? Her respect and her submission for him, and that's why she's set down as the example. Now, my point is, I hope it's clear, but let me make it clear if it's not. Sarah is not set down as the example for wives because of her love and affection and feelings for Abraham because there's no record of that. And you say, well, it says Michael loved David. Why isn't Michael set down as the example? Well, I'll go ahead and show you that. Go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel 6. Turn to 2 Samuel 6. <laughs> Here's the context for this. David has recently become king. One of his first actions was to bring the ark into Jerusalem. You probably remember what happened. The first time Uzzah saw the ark tipping, he reached out to right it, and he ended up getting killed. 
I'm not making a joke, but nothing quite brings a parade to a halt like someone dying, right? And so this whole procession comes to an end. David basically was brought up short publicly in front of everyone. God brought him up short because of the disobedient way he brought the ark in. The ark is sent to the home of Obed-Edom some number of months. Obed-Edom is blessed all that time, showing there's obviously nothing wrong with the ark, and God is not to be feared when he is being obeyed, or he's, in a sense, not to be feared when he's being feared, if that makes sense. And so then, some months later, David brings the ark correctly, men carrying it on their shoulders, into Jerusalem, and it's a particularly wonderful day for David for a couple reasons. One, because he loves the Lord. He's the man after God's own heart. He's thrilled to have the ark or God's presence in his capital, but it was an even more joyful day when you consider how poorly it went the first time, right? So it's going particularly well. David's feeling very blessed and joyful, and he wants to go home, and he wants to share some of this joy and blessing with his household, but it was ruined by his wife. Now look at verse 16. The ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window, and she saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And so that's how excited and joyful he was. He's leaping and whirling. And she despised him in her heart. Now, this could look a little odd, but I'm going to tell you, this is what I think is going on here. I have to say think because I can't tell you concretely why she was so angry because Scripture doesn't tell us, but this is my suspicion. I don't think David looked particularly good at this moment. I don't know if he was regularly a good dancer, or I don't know if this just wasn't the environment to be dancing and nobody else was dancing, but there's something about David's behavior at this moment that looked fairly embarrassing. Did David care, though? (laughs) No, I mean, he's the man after God's own heart, and he couldn't care less what anyone thinks. All he cares except for God, and that's who he cared about that moment, so he's going to leap and twirl regardless of how good or bad he looks. Now, Michael looks... Michael thought she knew what a king should and shouldn't do from who? Not David. From who? Her father, Saul. She's only known one king, and that king happened to be her father. And so Saul was a man, whereas David is only concerned with the inward. He's the man after God's own heart, only cares what God thinks, doesn't care about outward appearances. Saul is only concerned about outward appearances. Would Saul ever act like this? No, so Michael looks on and she thinks that this behavior is completely unbecoming of a king. And she happens to be his queen. So while David's embarrassing himself, she thinks, who else is he embarrassing? Her. She can't believe that her husband would act like this. She despises him. Look at verse 20. David returned to bless his house. And I just want you to picture this scene. He's thankful He's joyful. He wants to share this with his home. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, she came out to meet him. She couldn't even wait for what? She couldn't even wait for him to get into the house. She had to run out to confront him. That's how mad she was. She looks like a a mother whose son is on the way home from school and the teacher called and said that your, your son had a bad day and that mother just bursts out of the house and grabs him before he can even reach the driveway and starts chewing him out and pointing her finger at him. And, and that's what this looks like. That's what I imagine. I imagine a mother who bursts out of the home angry with her son, giving him some lecture about his behavior. And that's what Michael's doing here. And so ladies, I would ask, are any of you like this? Do you pounce on your husband when he does something wrong? Do you make him feel like he's a little boy who's in trouble? Or do you ever chastise your husband like Michael is about to chastise David in these verses? Look at the rest of verse 20. She says to him, and it's just dripping with sarcasm, dripping with ridicule as she says this. How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering self today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So she's mocking him. You hear the scorn, the disrespect in her words. And so David said in verse 21, he said, I know you love me because 1 Samuel 18, 20 says so, so it's all right when you talk to me like this. So he said, no, my point is, I'm making a joke, but I'm trying to make a point. Regardless of whether Michael loved David or not, he is not feeling loved. He is not feeling respected at this moment. And just to share one other point before we read these verses, I want you to know this is a low point for David too. As we go through this, I don't want you to think that I support his behavior or actions. The husbands can also learn from David in this account. Look at verse 21. 
David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. So God, or so David made sure to point out to Michael that God had chosen him over her father. Do you think it still might have stung Michael a little bit that her father had been rejected? Was this fairly prideful of David to point this out? This isn't the David that I know through most of First and Second Samuel to, to talk like this to, her, to his wife. He says, therefore, I'll play music before the Lord. I will be more un, even more undignified than this, and I'll be humble in my own sight, which is basically his way of saying what? You think this is bad? I can be even worse. That's what he said. You think this is undignified? I can be even more undignified. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in high honor. Now, if you write in your Bible, you can circle the words held in honor, draw a little line, and you can write the word respect, because this is probably the simplest, most concise definition of respect in all of Scripture, held in honor. So David said this to Michael, again, a low point. You might not like what I did. It might be embarrassing to you, but I can tell you that there are plenty of other women who like it. That's what he said. He said, you might not have liked it, but I know there's lots of other women who would like my behavior. Pretty prideful, pretty ugly thing to say to his wife. And I'll, I'll share this. I'm not making a defense for David's actions, but what David basically said was, you don't respect me. I know there's lots of other women I could find who do respect me or would respect me. And the reason I mention that is that's often what happens with men. It's not defensible because on a wedding day, a man is committing his life to that woman regardless of how she acts to him, but this is what men do. It's shameful, but a man says, you know what? She doesn't respect me. My wife doesn't. And then the next day he's at work. There happens to be some woman there who's always a good listener, always complimentary about his work, always available to sit near him during lunch or whatever the case. And guess how she always seems toward him? She always seems very respectful. And so this man says, well, my wife wouldn't respect me, but I know she does. And of course, I mean, she's any woman who would act flirtatiously or, or that friendly toward a married man is an ungodly shame, woman, um, you know, woman who should be ashamed anyway. But all he's looking at is just this woman that's giving, her, giving him some amount of attention. And he says, in, his, in his, the ugliness of his heart, he says, you know, my wife wouldn't respect me, but I bet she would. And this is how adultery begins. This is the direction it takes where men use disrespect as a motivation to go find another woman that they think will respect them. That's what David's saying here. He's like, you don't respect me, but I bet there's lots of other women who would. So there's three reasons we're looking at this. First, ladies, this gives you an example of how not to treat your husbands. Gentlemen, this gives us an example of how not to treat our wives. But third, this shows us that a woman can love her husband without respecting him because we're told that Michael loved David. Now, if we take 2 Samuel as an example, I can tell you that regardless of how Michael felt toward David, whether she did love him or not, my, David wasn't feeling respected. And look at verse 23. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. And this brings us to lesson three. Disrespect can change a husband's feelings toward his wife. Disrespect can change a husband's feelings toward his wife. I take verse 23 to mean that David no longer had relations with Michael. Some people disagree with me and they think that maybe God punished her for this and she was unable to have children. The reason I don't think that is when women were unable to have children, there's a recognition that God closed the womb and there's nothing here to support that. Instead, I think this verse is just saying that David wanted nothing more to do with her physically or, or intimately. He had no more sexual relations with her. Again, I'm not defending David's actions. This is a low point for him. But I do want you to notice here that Michael's behavior she was so disrespectful to him that it changed David's uh, feelings toward her. And again, I mean, this is the brilliance of God's word. This is the wisdom we get to see contained in these verses. What David did is a very common response from men when they feel disrespected by their wives. It's sinful, but what did David do? He ignored her. He neglected her. And commonly, when a man feels disrespected by his wife, one of the responses, although albeit a shameful one, is to neglect or to ignore his wife. 
And that's what David did. And because of his other sin and marrying multiple women, he had plenty of other women that he could look to for the relationships that he wanted that he was no longer getting from Michael. Now, I don't want to throw out too many names, so I'm going to ask you to, to please listen carefully as I try to show you something important. Michael was Saul's daughter. When Saul became angry, when Saul became angry with David, he took Michael or took his own daughter away from David. Saul had a general named Abner who defected to leave Saul and go and to join David. Take a look at 2 Samuel 3. Look at 2 Samuel 3, verse 12. Abner is trying to defect to join David. And in verse 12, Abner sent messengers on his behalf, and he said to David, whose land is this? In other words, the land belongs to you, David. Make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand, or I shall work to bring all Israel to you, because he was only king of Judah, the southern kingdom at this time, and not the northern tribes. So Abner says, I'll bring the entire nation away from Saul to make you king. Now, when the general of the man who wants to kill you tries to defect and join you, that's a pretty glorious day, it would seem, right? And this man even says, I'll bring the entire nation and make them subject to you. Look at verse 13 to see what David said. Good, I will make a covenant with you, but there's one thing I require. You will not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see me. So in other words, David said, it sounds wonderful to have you on my team. I would love for you to bring the rest of the nation underneath my rule, but you will not even see my face unless you bring my wife, Michael, to me. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. Look at 2 Samuel 6, where David wants nothing to do with Michael. How was he feeling about her a few chapters earlier? So strongly, so committed to her that he would not even let Abner join him unless Abner brought Micah with him. And so what's the point? The point is a woman's disrespect can change her husband's feelings toward her. When Michael disrespected David like she did in 2 Samuel 6, he seemed to have lost all interest in her. It wasn't right, but it's true. And I'll tell you this, when husbands are disrespected strongly by their wives, those husbands can begin to resent their wives, distance themselves, want nothing to do with them. So I just say this, ladies, if you're listening to this, I don't know any of you, you're feeling convicted because you have disrespected your husband, then you have a wonderful opportunity this afternoon to go home, look your husband in the eyes, and say, I'm very convicted will you please forgive me for the times that I have disrespected you? There's no excuse for it. I want you to be able to love me more easily than you probably have been able to because of the way that I have acted. So please forgive me for those times that I have been disrespectful to you. I'm truly sorry and convicted about it and pray that God helps me to be a better wife in this area. Now, the last thing I'd like to say to wives, your husband is commanded to love you unconditionally. It doesn't say husbands love your wives if... And so, ladies, you, I'm guessing you like that Ephesians 5.25 does not contain the word if, but look at Ephesians 5.33. Does it say respect your husband if? It doesn't, ladies, and this is a tough thing for me to say. You are commanded, once you walk down that aisle and became one with your husband, you are now commanded to respect him. It is not conditional on his behavior, just like it's not conditional on your behavior for him to love you. Our last lesson for husbands, lesson four, husbands can make respecting them easier. Husbands can make respecting them easier. We discussed wives making it easier for their husbands to love them. The corresponding point is husbands can definitely make it easier for their wives to respect them. All right, now please hear me when I say this. Wives generally have trouble submitting to men when they're not spiritual because they're afraid that that man is going to make the wrong decision. Wives generally have trouble respecting their husband when their husband has some sin in his life. Does that make sense? Gentlemen, when you have sin in your life, you are putting an unbelievably heavy burden on your wife's shoulders. So support me in this, gentlemen. I am commanding your wives to respect you. So what can you do? Be respectable. 
make it easier for them to respect you. It is a terrible thing. I don't want to say for me to stand here and say this because I'm not the one saying it. Who is commanding your wife to respect you? God's word is but you are making it unbelievably difficult for your wife to respect you when you keep some habitual or hidden sin in your life. Here's the tragedy. I suspect there are probably some women in here, while I have been talking, they have been saying, I want to respect my husband. I wish I could respect my husband. Pastor Scott, if I could only tell you how much I want to be able to look up to him but I know what he does. I hear the way that he talks to our children. I see the way that he neglects us. I see the way he doesn't work hard to take care of our family. I know the things that he looks at on the computer. Gentlemen, there are not many things that can make it harder for your wife to respect you than for you to look at things that you shouldn't. You need to be ripping your eyes away from other women. And I don't mean on the computer. I just mean walking down the street. If there's, an, if there's an immodestly dressed woman, your wife should see your head turn. She should see your eyes look away. Now, if your wife knows that you look at things that you shouldn't, not only is that destroying your sanctification, not only is that ruining your relationship with the Lord, you're also making it unbelievably difficult for your wife to be able to respect you. When I have been in counseling and I've heard women say, I want to respect him, but I know that he looks at things he shouldn't, it's so hard for me to defend that man. It is so hard for me to come to support a man who does that. So gentlemen, you need to repent if that's going on in your life. Get the help. You're very blessed. I don't counsel as much as Pastor Kerry does. I don't know how he has the time to do all the counseling that he does. You're very, very blessed, and I mean this sincerely, to have a man who loves you as much as he does. But with that, there's no reason for any of you gentlemen to be struggling with this secretly. You can get the help you need at this church, and I would not say that at some of their churches. I didn't say that at the church last week. No, no offense against them. I just didn't know their pastors like I know Pastor Kerry. This is not something that you should be struggling with alone. Keep in mind that your wives do want to respect you they do want to look up to you. Make that easier for them to do. Now, one final lesson for the conference that I hope can tie everything together that we've discussed up to this point. Lesson five, wives respect their husbands by making their spiritual leadership easier. Wives can respect their husbands by making their husbands' spiritual leadership easier. So we've talked a lot about husbands being spiritual leaders. It's sort of threaded its way through most of our messages. And ladies, I bet some of you at the, up to this point have been listening, and, you're, and, and I'm glad if you've said this in your heart. You're like, oh, I'm so thankful, Pastor Scott, that you're telling my husband to be a spiritual leader. This is what I have wanted for so long. I'm glad that he's hearing this. I'm glad he came to this conference so that you can challenge him to be the spiritual leader in our home. Ladies, you play a huge part in that. You might not think that, but you play a huge part in that. Because let me tell you, most husbands are terrified to pray in front of their wives. Say nothing about read the word with their wives or their families. Most husbands are terrified that they're not going to sound like Pastor Kerry, or they're not going to sound like that guy on the radio, or they're not going to sound like John MacArthur. So ladies, let me give you some encouragements. Here's, your husband, he might fumble every word he says when he prays and he might mispronounce most of the names that he encounters in God's word. And do you know what you still do? You put your hand on his leg, and you look him in the eyes, and you thank him for being a godly man. I don't care if he can't read half of the words correctly. I mean, I don't care if he's in the book of Leviticus. You're thankful for what he's teaching. You're thankful for what he's reading. And you look at him and commend him for that. Let him know how much you appreciate. Let him know that you recognize that you're in the 0.0000001% of women who actually have a husband that does what? Reads the word with her and prays with her. If you have a husband who opens the word with you, ladies, you are so fortunate. You are so blessed because there are so many other women who just wish that they had a husband who would bring them to a conference like this. Say nothing about sit next to her in church. Say nothing about pray with her at home and open the word with her. 
So you encourage him. You encourage him. There was a, there was a time early in our relationship we weren't married, and I really, I thought Katie was a deeply spiritual woman, and I really wanted to impress her, and so I decided I was going to teach this Bible study. I think it was one of our first ones, and I thought, I really need to impress her, so I'm going to show these parallels between a story in Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah, and so I thought it was going to make me look good, and I think it probably just made me look weird. (laughs) It was probably the most confusing Bible study that has ever been taught, and so when we finished, four hours later, (laughs) I thought, oh man, that's bad. You know, this is stepping up and striking out, and she's probably not going to want to read the Bible with me again, and I hope I can get my act together and, and, you know, do a little better job next time. So fast forward a couple hours, and she was talking to her best friend Chelsea on the phone, and I heard Katie say, I'm so thankful to have a man that will open the Bible with me. That's what she said. Can you imagine how fearful I was after teaching this terribly confusing and boring and long Bible study, thinking, will Katie ever want to read the Bible with me again? And then to hear her on the phone with her friend saying, and she didn't know I could hear her, saying, I'm so thankful to have a man who will open the Bible with me like this. This is what I've wanted for so many years. So ladies, when your husband reads the Bible with you, be interested. Again, it might be Leviticus. Maybe he's talking burnt offerings, and burnt offerings have never sounded so exciting to you before. (laughs) Whatever it is, you're you're enthusiastic. You love it. I mean, peace offerings have never sounded more fun. Support your husband by rounding up the kids if you have any of the kids so that they know you're committed to these devotional times too. Katie's very good about that, getting the kids to come together, and they're not often excited about, you know, doing Bible studies as a family either. And here are two two discouragements. First, this is tough because I don't want to discourage you from asking your husband questions or disagreeing with him when he says things wrong, because he probably will, and as his helper, you can offer some of those corrections. But I will tell you this, ladies. If your husband thinks that every time he opens a Bible with you, it's going to be a debate, or he thinks you're going to question every single thing that comes out of his mouth, don't be surprised if your husband doesn't open the Bible with you. For every withdrawal you make, you've got to make a bunch of deposits, ladies. Does that make sense? If you're going to make a withdrawal, you need to make a bunch of deposits. Now, there's one couple who are counseling, and I told this gentleman, you've got to be a better spiritual leader. You've got to read the word with your wife. He finally started doing that. He came back about a month later, and I said, how's it going? He said, I'm never opening the Bible with my wife again. And I said, why? I thought I was expecting their marriage to be better. And he goes, no, things are worse than ever, because every time we open the Bible, she wants to argue with me about everything. She thinks that everything I say is wrong. And between the two of them, the truth is she knew the Bible a lot better. She just did. Matter of fact, she married a man that was considerably less mature spiritually than her. But she still had a responsibility to support him, and she wasn't. So she wanted to point out all these ways he was wrong. It was embarrassing to him, and he stopped reading the Bible with her. Second, don't under any circumstances ever compare your husband to another husband. Don't ever compare your husband to another Bible teacher. Your husband is not in the position that Pastor Carrie and I are in to study God's word for 30 hours a week. Your husband is working hard throughout the week to take care of you and your family. So when he opens the Bible, don't expect a Billy Graham crusade. (laughs) Don't expect a John MacArthur sermon. Understand that it's a tremendous thing just for your husband to be reading the word with you. And where is the power anyway? Is it in your husband or is it in the word of God? So be thankful that the word is just going out and washing over your family and doing that work. Let me ask you to picture something. There's a man who's sitting here today, and he's feeling particularly convicted by some of these messages about being a spiritual leader in his home, and he's making the decision now that he's going to go home and change things. And so let's fast forward to Monday. Let's follow this man to his work at Monday. And he's sitting at work, and he has decided, as he's been reflecting on these messages and, and, and the burden and conviction that has been weighing on him, that today is the day he's going to change things. And he's going to go home, and he's going to lead his family in a Bible study for the first time. He's never done this before. Can you imagine his fears? Can you imagine the questions that he's asking? If, if women are terrified... Like 1 Peter 3 describes, can you imagine this man's terror? What if I don't know what to say? What if she asks me or one of the kids asks me a question that I can't answer? What if I don't sound like Pastor Kerry? What if I don't sound like that guy on the radio? 
that he has been summoning up all of his courage and he's committed that when he gets home and they finish dinner tonight, he's going to ask everyone to go get their Bibles. So now, fast forward a few hours. Picture them at the dinner table. Dinner concludes, and the husband says, his heart is racing at this moment. Let's try something different tonight. Why doesn't everyone go and get their Bibles and come back to the table? Now imagine his wife says, do we have to do this right now? I wanted to get the table picked up. Or she says, oh, is that the version of the Bible that we were going to use? Can we use this one instead? Or she said, oh, is that the passage that you're going to read? I don't know that that's the best choice. I think that's probably going to be confusing to our children. Why don't you do this instead? Or she says, oh, is that really how to pronounce his name? Or, oh, I was listening to this sermon on the radio, and that's not what this pastor said about those verses that you just read. Oh, I don't think that's right. Oh, why don't you go to the church and ask Pastor Carrier? Why don't you ask one of the elders or our home fellowship leader? Uh, when Pastor Scott was talking about reading the Bible as a family, I'm not sure that this is really what he meant that it should look like. Or, oh, wow, this first Bible study sure is long. And I mention that because that's what one woman said one time. I, brought her, I was counseling a husband and wife. I tried to get them to get their devotional times in order. They come into my office. They're sitting across from me, and he's sharing about how the Bible studies have went, and he was feeling insecure that they hadn't been going particularly well. And I looked to his wife, and I said, how do you feel like these Bible studies have went? All of the things that she could have said. I was looking to her, waiting for her to come and help me in encouraging her husband. And her response was, well, they've been pretty long. That's what she said. And I just went like this. I just thought, there's probably no way that this man's going to want to read the Bible with his family again, with a wife who's acting like this. Now, do you think the man in that story is ever going to want to read the Bible with his family if that's how his wife responds? Now, picture this. Same man, same situation, same nervousness all day, same terror, same summoning up of courage. Fast forward to dinner. Dinner finishes. He tells everyone to get their Bibles. And now, picture this man's wife says, I am so thankful that you're doing this with us. I'm so thankful to have a godly man that'll read the Bible with his family. I've been praying for this. What a dream come true to have a husband who will open the word of God with us. I know many women do not have what you're blessing me with. I feel so thankful to have a husband who will do this because I know that there are so many women who wish that they could be in my situation right now. If there are children, the wife says, isn't this great? You are so blessed to have a daddy who will read the word with you. Let's go get our Bibles and do what we can to support him. Now, how do you, now, even if that guy teaches the worst Bible study ever, how do you think he's going to feel about opening the Bible with his family again? He's going to look forward to it. He's going to be enthusiastic about it. And at the end of the Bible study, she prays. And she says, Lord, I am so thankful to have such a godly man. Thank you. And she prays this loudly so the children can hear, so he can hear. Thank you for giving me a man who will read the Bible with us like this. We are so blessed. Please help him to lead our family well. What a huge responsibility he has. You have called me to be his helper. Please help me to help him. Now, gentlemen, this is the call that is on our shoulders as men. Going back to that second message, if we're going to love our, our wives as Christ loves the church, this is what God expects. But ladies, look at me. Give, your, give me your attention when I ask this. Do you see the huge part you play in your husband's spiritual leadership in the home? And if there's children here, which I think it's a wonderful thing you came, and I'll just say, if you don't have children, then your family Bible study is you and your wife, and that's a wonderful thing. Katie says, well, sometimes you talk about families, and people might think if they don't have children, then your family is you and your wife, and that is a wonderful Bible study. That is a wonderful family. And I would say if there's children here, and your father has the courage to open the word, with his family, you need to recognize how fortunate you are. You need to recognize how blessed you are to have a father who does something that puts you in the point zero 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 whatever category of children who have that. Now, with that said, I want to thank you for the, the privilege of being able to share these messages with you. We're not finished quite yet. My wife, Pastor Carrie, and Lois are going to come up front, and we'll try to take your questions now that you wrote on those, on those slips of paper. So, so, so could you maybe hold those slips up, and we'll try to gather them? If you had, were there some? questions for us, or else this will be a pretty short Q&A. 
hold those questions up, and then maybe we'll bring some chairs up front. Let's grab some chairs real quick. Testing. Okay, so all I can say is I'm probably the moderator simply to ask. No, these I'm moderating. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking a lot. That's why you're up here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. First, Scott, her first question is for Scott, it says here. <laughs> uh, what to do or say when your wife is angry? Serious? Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, Lois is never angry, so you don't know? <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> is this off? Should I, should I just pass this around? We can use both of them. Okay. So, what to do or say when your wife is angry? You know, I think one of the best advice that I was ever given as a, as a biblical counselor and I was going in for ordination is simply, first and foremost, pray, right? You have to be a man of prayer and you have to say lord even if it's in the midst of that situation lord help me give me wisdom right now to not respond back in anger back in the flesh um and then and then i would say the next thing is probably go to book of the book of proverbs that comes to my mind is a gentle answer turns away wrath wrath and so i'd say i think you need to really work hard at uh answering in the spirit, not in the flesh, because our flesh is the natural tendency for us to want to answer in. Mm -hmm, very good. Scott. I would just say, I've seen a very sincere apology and request for forgiveness have the potential to diffuse a lot of anger. And so asking sincerely and saying, I'm very sorry, will you please forgive me, can really go far in terms of diffusing anger. And I would also say that you should be honest if, if you're a woman, or if you're a man for that matter, if you're, that it was about an angry wife, and if the wife can't forgive at that moment, she shouldn't lie and say she should. She should say, I can't forgive you right now, I'm still mad. And then the husband should say, take all the time you need. Take the time you need. I understand I was wrong, I should not have done that. I want you to forgive me, but I'll give you the space and time that you need. So. Amen, I would agree. Ladies, do you guys wanna say anything? What was Katie on that one? I would just say it helps a, a wife who's rightly angry in a sense because there was um, some kind of sin on his part, it helps her tremendously to hear him admit it. And even, like Scott said, to be willing to give her time to come around. Okay, number two, can you explain why we're supposed to love our spouse more than our children? <laughs> I, don't have an, I don't have a thought. <laughs> Let me try to think. Of, can I explain why? Um, I'd say first and foremost because that's your first ministry. Um, that is your number one ministry. I think children are, uh, we've always said this, Lois and I have, they're a, a welcome addition to our family. Um, when a man and a woman marry, they become a family. It doesn't happen when you have your first child. And so, and we're also raising our children to be independent. We're, we're getting ready to shoot them off as arrows into the, into the world, right? And so if there's no... If there's no, if that's not the, the center of our, of our marriage, our husband and wife, how a wife loves her husband or how a husband loves his wife, then what are we going to have after 18 years, 20 years after, when they're gone? When they're gone, very good. So, Scott? Yeah, I, I think we've all heard those situations where there's a couple and then the children leave and the couple is then depressed and they're discouraged because so much was bound up in their children, and I think God is graciously preparing us for that time.
by um, commanding us to invest even um, more in our spouse than in our, ch- in our children because at some point we're not going to have those children with us. They're going get, to get older and have their own families. You're going to pass off your daughters and your sons are going to marry someone and then it'll be you and Lois probably at home and Katie and I. And so. Katie, anything? Um, Whatever you like. Okay. I thought it'd be good. <laughs> so I, I um, can relate to this because I texted my husband and I said, I wish sometimes God could turn off the nurturing side of me toward my children. And so leaving my kids sick was not easy for me. And honestly, I didn't want to come. And my husband said, we're going. And I was like, Ugh. and so I did not, I did a lot of kicking and screaming lesson two part, whatever that was. <laughs> Um, I did not do a good job, and he did excellent in loving me through that and just calmly saying, we're going. And so I texted him and said, well, I'm going to be squirming a lot in my seat on the submission message, which I was back there, very squirmy. But I think that God reminded me in the midst of that, like Carrie said, your husband is your number one ministry, your children come second. And when they see that, it actually blesses our children to see a unified front in the marriage, it's when we're divided and choosing our children over our spouse that our children actually lose out. Amen. Very good. Well said. All right, number three. What does it look like practically for a wife to step back and put her husband in a position to lead? He may or may not be a believer. I said everything I can say about that. It was in my <laughs> message. I have nothing else. Brother. So deliver, <laughs> deliver. You know, I, I honestly think that I think what Scott said too, uh, Pastor Scott said earlier, is, is simply the fact that when you don't have as your default to step in at the last moment, he will be forced to lead. And so I'd say, ladies, as much as it's going to take you to sit on your hands or to bite your tongue, I would say, let that happen. And even if it means, hey, do you understand that this is going to be a great financial loss to us? Well, then he'll have to pick that up. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's like, it's... I have a, an older, believing, uh, unbelieving brother, and my mother has rescued him time and time mm-hmm. again financially. This man is in his 50s, and, um, and I cannot tell you the untold thousands and mm-hmm. tens of thousands of dollars that my mother has given to him ever since I remember him in high school who couldn't pay his car payment. So what's happened? is he has, is a married man, maybe some of you guys know him, um, but he, he's visited here before, but I'll just be honest with you, that has not helped him one bit to learn to be a leader in his home and especially a good financial manager. So let's translate that into a, into a husband and wife situation. Mm-hmm. How is that going to be when a wife continually is right there with the right answer right? The right thing to do, and she rescues him time and time again. Very good. Okay, what if he's not a believer and she knows it? Again, I don't think, um, you can't moralize the unbeliever. We always say that, right? You cannot expect the unbelieving spouse to act like a believer. And so I think you're going to have to understand that in those situations, it's just going to be rough. And I think you're going to have to try to encourage him. Maybe he thinks he's a believer, right? Um, and in those situations, I think you're going to have to just encourage him as much as possible to be that, be- to be that leader um, and do everything you can to encourage that and thank him for every mm-hmm. little sign of leading that he mm-hmm. does show. Very good. Do you want to add something to that? Or? Okay. This one's a two-parter. How would a wife slash husband implement these insights uh, in light of insecurity, uh, lessons, traditions, etc., learned as a child from his or her parents? Mm. So how would a wife, husband implement these insights in light of insecurities, lessons, traditions, etc., learned as a child from his or her parents. When you ladies want to jump in on that one. Well, you're basically switching what role model you're going to follow. I mean, it's natural to follow what you saw growing up in your home. But if the Bible's showing you a different picture, you have to make a deliberate um, 
decision to follow this picture instead. It's going to be a deliberate overturning of what comes naturally to you. But if you're, if you're gonna follow God's ways, God will give you the wisdom and the strength to do it, and how, you know, you'll figure it out. His Spirit's in you, guiding you to do this. That's stronger than the tradition of what you saw mm -hmm. growing up. Very good. I'd say the exact same thing. You guys, most of us never grew up in a perfect home. <laughs> I see that tongue in cheek. Um, obviously, none of us did, right? And so there are things that God's word will have to always inform how we live our lives. And if God shows you something that no matter who's done it or, you know, we've done it like that way for, you know, five generations of, you know, the Green family, you know, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to break with tradition and I'm going to do things God's way. And I think God wants, God wants that out of more than anything else is for us to be obedient to him. Number two, how would you suggest a couple go about correcting role hmm. reversal, i.e. wife takes on more traditional, traditional man-husband roles and the husband takes on more of the female wife roles? I have one word for that. Repent. Hmm. <laughs> Sincerely, mm -hmm. I would just say if you recognize that, if you recognize that that's what you're doing, then, then real repentance means what? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that results always in a change of action. And so if God shows you something, and he's, he's shown me a lot this weekend, I'm so thankful for Pastor Scott's teaching. It was excellent. And I can't wait to recommend this conference um, to a lot of people. But sincerely, I would say if God shows you something, then... God will only give you more light, more revelation as you implement what he's already shown you. And praise God for that. To, mm -hmm. Because to whom much has been given? Much is required. Amen. Anything I, else? Quick I got my degree in psychology, which was a big waste. But the whole pursuit was, <laughs> okay, all these people are like, how can I change? How can I change? Right? Well, that doesn't change within the Christian circles I'm in. They all want to change. And they all want to get out of their ruts that their parents were in. And so Romans 12, 2 was a huge, like, eye-opener for me. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know the Lord's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That was like all my psychology pursuit was wrapped up in that. If I want to change and not to conform to the patterns of my parents and of the world, my mind has to be transformed. And we know that's transformed through the word of God. So as you're reading seeking, asking the Lord, what, show me wisdom in this area. So let's say you struggle with materialism and God brings Colossians 3, 1 to mind, set your mind on things that are above where Christ is. And so whenever you're tempted to go back to that old pattern, pray God will bring a, a verse to mind that helps you transform your behavior. My husband feels a heavy weight of conviction and easily feels like a failure. Mm. I feel the need to be only a source of encouragement. Mm. We often have difficulty if I need to express negative emotions or unmet needs. How can I be honest with him without discouraging him or dismissing my hurts? Mm -hmm. Scott? I would say something I kind of said toward the end of this message, try to make a lot of deposits for every withdrawal, especially if you have a man who's feeling like a failure or very insecure already, then you're going to have to make sure that you've really built him up regarding some number of positive things. And rare, rare is the man that when looking at his life, you can't find some number of positive things. I think often one of the most convicting passages in the entire Bible to me is 2 Samuel 1, where David sings, or, oh, how the mighty have fallen, and he praises Saul up and down. And I'm thinking, you know, if David could find all these great things to say about Saul, who was a fairly dishonorable man who had been trying to murder him for some number of years, then how shameful is it if I couldn't look at a person who's considerably better than Saul and not be able to find some number of, of commendable things. And so find those things in your husband, commend him for those things um, some number of times before you make offer that criticism to him. I would say the exact same thing. So a lot of times criticism, you guys, we say it, um, we say it in unguarded moments and maybe not the best way. So take time, pray about, Lord, how can I say this? Maybe, maybe go out with your husband, take time to really sit down. I've often found that talking to somebody about something difficult, 
I try to do it in, in an environment that mm. is not normal that I normally sit in. Not your office. Not my office. <laughs> yeah, not my couch yeah. in my home, you know, different things like that that, that I don't normally go to. And, and, um, and exactly what Scott said, hey, make a lot of deposits before you, before you take that withdrawal out. But God's word says the exact same thing. What do we see in, you know, we see in all the revelation, the churches in Revelation, which we just finished going through. You see all these positive things before, mm -hmm. Jesus says, right? And then Very he says, good. this I have, have against you. Mm -hmm. Okay, under the pretense of submission, can't we recognize spousal differences? No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yes, we can. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I would say absolutely, too. Well, the... okay. One time, Greg Laurie said something funny. Greg Laurie was talking about uh, all these people who were getting divorces because of irreconcilable differences. And Greg Laurie said, people divorcing over irreconcilable differences. My wife and I have had irreconcilable differences since we got married. That was funny. Why didn't anyone laugh at that? Okay. 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 I thought that was funny. And he was making a good point with that joke that every marriage involves people with considerable differences. And I've seen great marriages where people had a lot of similarities, and I've seen great marriages where people had a lot of differences, and I've seen some bad marriages where people had a lot of similarities and people had a lot of differences. So it's not necessarily your similarities and differences that make a healthy marriage or an unhealthy marriage. It's your relationship with Christ and, built and obedience to his word. You can take two people who are almost identical in many ways, and they could have a miserable marriage. And you could take two people who... Are, who um, are total opposites, and they could have a wonderful marriage mm -hmm. if they're being committed to obeying God's word. And so the differences, in a sense, are, are somewhat irrelevant. It's good to be aware of them and know how best to respond to them and know. I tried to say it a few times in my messages through the um, teach. I would say, learn your spouse, learn your spouse. Well, that's sort of a way of saying, be familiar with your spouse's differences from you so you know how to respond. But the real issue isn't whether you're similar or different, it's whether you're committed to obeying the Lord obeying what his word says. And then any marriage, regardless of differences or similarities, can be a real blessing and joy. Amen. Because of how the world has twisted the biblical definition of femininity, and since a husband honors his wife's femininity, mm -hmm. what is the biblical definition of femininity, and what does that look like practically? Ladies? That's a good one. <clears throat> Who wants to start? Well, God defined it in the garden when he said the guy needs a helper. And then he made somebody similar but really different in this, at the same time. And I think you boil that down. If you find yourself married, then your job description is to help him do whatever God has him on this planet to do. And that looks different in the details from you know every marriage and every ministry. What I do for Carrie is not the same as what Katie does for Scott necessarily. But it's what Carrie needs, and I've got to learn it and do it. Um, and that, I think, is femininity from God's point of view. He made me to help him get his God-given job done. The, oh, go ahead. the one thing in God's word, which I'd be remiss if I wasn't honest about this, because I feel like I'd be shrinking back from saying what God's word said. And if you take any issue with this, my request would simply be that you go to the word and look at it and pray over it and see if what I'm saying is true or not. The only <clears throat> physically identifying feature that seems to be mentioned in God's word to define men versus women is hair length. You can read in 1 Corinthians 11, and it says that it's a shame for a man to have long hair, and it's equally shameful for a woman to have short hair. Now, what is long and short? Well, since the Bible doesn't tell us, I'm not going to tell you, because I can't tell you because the Bible doesn't say, but I think culturally, what would be, because all the pictures of Jesus look like he had this very long, flowing, golden hair, right? Well, in that day, maybe it was acceptable for a man to not be considered having long hair if his hair went to his shoulders because women's hair might have went to their waist. So I would just say what is considered long hair would, would seem to be what women should have. What is considered um, short hair is what men, is what men should, should strive to have. Those seem to be the only physically identifiers, physical identifiers of masculinity versus femininity. In terms of um, skirts or dresses, if some people look at that and they say, well, then my wife's always going to wear a skirt. Obviously, men in New Testament times or in the ancient world, they wore robes that look like skirts. And so it changes with culture. And so I would just say, and I can't go beyond this, it's like sometimes people say, how short, how short can a, a woman's skirt be? Well, if I answer that and I give any, any length or mention any inches, I'm going to be legalistic because I'm saying what God's word doesn't say. I'm speaking into silence. 
And so what I would just say is consider in our culture what looks masculine, and we should strive for that, except now it's being blurred so much it's almost hard to tell, and consider what, what, is consider what looks feminine culturally, and, and we should strive for that. But in terms of God's word, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know anything outside of 1 Corinthians 11, hair length. I think, too, if this is a woman who asks this, which I'm guessing, there's a book out by Nancy Lee DeMoss Wolgamoth. She's got this crazy name now because she got married. But her, <laughs> her, her book's called Adorned, and it goes breaks down Titus 2 by each phrase. And I really enjoyed that. Teach the younger women to love their husbands, love their children, keep the home, be chaste. And those descriptions to me, that's what God wants women to be that's like. Feminine. So to me, that's what it means to be feminine. Very good. This sounds like what Lois was saying. And I love Proverbs 31 too. And, and I've walked my way through. I write my, no, or my, I, my wife an email, a note each week, Lord willing. And, uh, and I, I've taken each one of those verses and I've just I've praised her for how she's done. And so I think that's also a picture of femininity. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's a question. Isn't it better not to get married, as Paul said? Here's my answer to that. (laughs) Yes. No, just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, Scott's nudging me. (laughs) What are you thinking? I I just I knew this was a big mistake to bring you up here. I knew it. (laughs) Okay, here it is in First Corinthians, and I would say I would answer it like this, and I'll let you jump on. I'd say context. Very context, good. I agree, absolutely. context. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty-six. Here's what it says: I think then that it is good, in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. See what the context is. So I think Paul was talking to the Corinthians. It was a very difficult time in the in the history of the church at this point in time. Nero was on the throne. Christians were being were being uh, sent to the to the lions, um, and you know we don't know exactly what was happening because we don't know exactly what year this letter was written, but it was it was early time on. Terrible persecution. Yeah, it was a terrible time of persecution. So that's what he's saying. But every time we see it, I Pastor Scott mentioned it. It's the one time that God said that something wasn't good, right? And when was it? Man being alone. Man being alone. Even a little later in the, those verses, after he says that, he says, but if you, marry, if you burn or you have, you have physical desires, then you should marry. And I know this is a little uncomfortable to discuss. I know I feel like it's the elephant in the room, but the Catholic Church has called men to singleness who don't have the gift of singleness. Do you see the terrible price that the Catholic Church has paid calling men to singleness when they did not have the gift of singleness? Wisdom is justified by her children. And so the wisdom or really the foolishness of that decision is shown by inviting men to be single who don't have that gift. Now, if you have the gift, which interestingly marriage is called a gift and singleness is called a gift. So if you legitimately have the gift of singleness, then there's nothing wrong, then that's a gift for you to observe. But you shouldn't strive to observe it if you don't, if you don't have it. Amen, amen. So this one is a three word question, I think. Is it possible? So I imagine if we take it in the context of this entire marriage conference, is it possible to really live like this? Mm. Pastor Scott, I'll let you <laughs> answer this one, brother. <laughs> well, God commands us and he equips us through the power of the gospel working in our hearts and lives to be the husbands and wives he wants us to be. And, but we are fleshly. We have sinful natures that war against the spirit that are always... Um, combating what God is doing in our lives. And so I would just say briefly, hopefully the trajectory of our lives and our marriages is always this way, right? I think we tend to think that our sanctification or the growth in our marriages is going to be this nice, gentle 45 degree slope, right? But it's often a lot more like the stock market. Does that make sense? Sometimes there's some big dips or even recessions. But, but overall, if we're committed to obeying God's word, then I, I'm completely comfortable telling you this. I'm not a prophet, but if you make a decision today to obey God's word, regardless of whether it makes sense, regardless of whether you like it, regardless of whether it's attractive to you, then you're going to see growth in your marriage and sanctification. And um, that's just because that's what God's word, uh, that's not a a promise from me, that's a promise from from the Lord himself, which is why I feel comfortable sharing it with you. So you, God wants, we should remember, God wants marriage to be a blessing and a gift to us. So I do think it's possible that our marriages will never be perfect, but they can be the pleasure and joy that the Lord um, desires them to be. Okay, 
those were all the questions that we have. You guys, I know that Pastor Scott and Katie are going to be in the back, and they're going to be at their book table. Mm-hmm. They're going to be here tomorrow. Um, book table will still be here tomorrow. Did you guys enjoy this marriage conference? Amen. <laughs> Brother, you did a fantastic Praise job. God. You really did. And, it's, and a uh, it's a privilege to have you guys stay with us, and you guys are invited anytime. Thank you. So I really mean that. Um, you need to come visit us. Yeah, <laughs> Lord willing. Okay. So we, um, I think all of us have been challenged, and I know. I had already put in, no, in my notes, like, okay, at the very end, read Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Mm. But this guy already stole it from me. So, <laughs> so I just want to remind you guys, again, build mm. on the foundation, right? And, um, and build on a foundation that's founded on the rock, not on sand. Mm-hmm. And the only difference between these two builders is one listened, mm-hmm and obeyed, and the other one listened, and he didn't obey. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say the real hard job now is to go home and put this into practice. And uh, you guys, can you guys all turn around, and can we all stand up and thank our crew who helped us? Sincerely, they deserve it. (laughs) Very good. Good job, Terry. I don't think they were expecting that, but you guys did a fantastic mm-hmm. job for all the way from creating the bulletins, the invites, to uh, um, the cleaning crew that came early to clean our bathrooms, to clean the mm-hmm. church sanctuary, um, all the decorations. Thank you, Nancy. I mean, it just goes on and on. The food was spectacular. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was fabulous, and all for $12.50. I mean, is that not cool or what? <laughs> So you guys did a great job. Thank you once again for blessing us. Can I pray? And we'll end our time together. Lord, I thank you again for just the absolute privilege and wonderful, wonderful blessing it is to be married. I thank you for Pastor Scott and his, the vision that he cast today, yesterday evening and this morning on what a marriage can be and should be through the strength of the Holy Spirit. Lord, none of us are perfect, and you don't ask for that, but you're, you always talk about direction, not perfection. There's only one who's perfect. And Lord, we want to honor you by, by doing everything we can when you show us something that we truly repent from it and believe your word despite our feelings, despite the circumstances, and just move forward in faith. And I know there's probably a lot of people here who just need to move forward in faith, Lord, that what your word says is true. And so I pray for a real change and growth in all of our marriages, Lord. And I pray for these young people. Oh, Lord, send young men who would take, uh, take these young women and lead them well. And I pray for young women, Lord, young ladies who want to want to honor you with their femininity, with their biblical commitment to you and your word and and doing everything it says. And Lord, I thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins that we have and the grace and the mercy that you show us each and every day. Without that, Lord, all of us would be lost. Thank you again for this day. Lord, help us just to honor you with our obedience in all these things. We all pray these things in the name of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks again, you guys. Thanks, you guys.